Thank you for blessing us in the song today for each one who has sung. I have been preaching a series on the Ten Commandments periodically, and today I'm I'm coming to that eighth commandment. Uh, I'm reading mainly from Ephesians four, but if you want to turn to Exodus chapter twenty. And uh, just four words uh, from Exodus 20 and verse 15. I'm sharing with you on respecting the rights of others. And Exodus 20 and verse 15 says, Thou shalt not kill. In Ephesians 4, verse 28 says, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking but be put away from you with all malice. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearty, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Are you a thief? Most of us would pass over this Eighth Commandment, and we would say, this is one commandment that I do not break. And yet, stealing is one of the most common sins of our day. And this sin is, we commit, and in many cases, we justify ourselves in doing so. Martin Luther once said that if all thieves were hanged on the gallows, the world would soon be desert. What is stealing? Well, it is taking things that don't belong to us, that are the property of others. And never have we seen a day when stealing has become so common and when the thief is so brave. Thieves go into businesses, and we've seen it on TV, in broad daylight, take what they want, walk out the door, and no one attempts to stop them. In broad daylight, thieves go into businesses, and they fill up their bags or fill up their buggies, and uh, go out the door with no consequences. There are many things that lead to stealing. One is poverty. Another is laziness, and that's probably one of the bigger things. Greed, mental disorders, selfishness, covetousness, no regard for law and order, no regard for the rights of others. And the number of thieves is increasing annually. And the average age of thieves is becoming lower and lower. And so this is a commandment that is broken by people from all walks of life. So we need to stress this commandment, thou shalt not steal. No, first of all, sometimes we steal from others. As a Christian, we are supposed to love one another, respect one another. We're supposed to be seeking the well-being of others instead of our own. And yet, 
probably every one of us is guilty of breaking this commandment. We would say, no, I don't steal. Sometimes we steal the property of others. There are so few people, so few Christians, who can rejoice at the success of others. You know, the Bible tells us to weep with them that weep, rejoice with them that do rejoice. I think sometimes it's easier for us to weep with those who weep than to rejoice with those re that rejoice. To rejoice at the success of others. When others prosper, sometimes we become envious. We become jealous. Uh, our respect for others diminishes. Or simply out of greed and covetousness and discontentment, uh, we want to get ahead ourselves and we want to prosper. And so sometimes we begin to lower our standards. And we begin to live by worldly standards. And so we put our own greed above the rights of others. Now, what are some of the ways that we steal from others? Most of us would not break into someone's house or business and rob them. But we use worldly tactics sometimes to take advantage of others. So how do we steal from others? Well, by not paying our debts, by unpaid bills, by altering a product, by misrepresenting the quality, by not giving an honest day's work for an honest day's pay, and someone will say, well, I don't get an honest day's pay, but you're getting what you agreed to work for, and so we should give an honest day's work. And so by these and other ways, we steal the property of others. We take that which does not belong to us. But sometimes we steal by injuring the person of others. And I think this kind of theft is one of the worst kinds. And yet sometimes we do this with little or no thought. When we steal from the person of others, sometimes we steal their good name, their influence, their effectiveness by gossip or carrying tales. And sometimes when we hear uh, something about someone, we don't wait to discover whether it is true or not. Sometimes we do like the mainstream media does, and sometimes we do like presidents have done. Uh, before a person is tried, they just pronounce them guilty. And nowadays, a person is guilty until proven innocent. It used to be you were innocent until proven guilty. I try to make it, try to make it a practice. If there's someone that I know that I confident and I hear something bad about them, I'm not going to believe it until I know it to be true. I think we owe it to a person to give them the benefit of the doubt and not to jump to conclusions when sometimes we hear gossip about somebody. <coughs> and really, gossip is about 90% lies to begin with, isn't it? Because it gets altered and, and taken out of context and added to and, and taken from. And so sometimes we just steal from the person of others. Sometimes we steal from others by a look. Someone mentions the name of a person and we roll our eyes. We give a suspicious look. And this casts doubts upon a person's character, upon their good name, and it lessens the influence of another person. 
And usually we do this out of jealousy or out of self-righteousness, out of lack of love or out of disobedience to God or out of an unchristian attitude or disposition. We take from others. When we deceive others, we're stealing from them. A good example, I think, of this is Jacob in the scriptures. Jacob took advantage of his, of his brother Esau's hunger and his weakness to obtain the birthright. And then Jacob deceived his father, who was blind, and received the, the blessing that was due to the oldest brother. Many of us are guilty of stealing the reputation of others, their good name, their influence with others. And so I think if ever there was a need for the church world to have a spirit of honesty and of justice and of fairness, we need to respect the rights of others, the property of others, the reputation of others. We need to guard one another out of love and consideration. The Bible says, consider thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So, sometimes we steal from others. And then sometimes we steal from ourselves. Now, unbelievers rob themselves by rejecting Jesus Christ as Savior they rob themselves of everlasting life of heaven they rob themselves of the joys and the benefits of the Christian life really the soul of humanity cries out for God and yet the unbeliever robs his soul of the peace of God and the presence of God by rejecting him as Savior. Instead of giving themselves to God, they give themselves to Satan who destroys every good thing about a person and who ultimately destroys the soul. God has put in every person a desire for God. That there's, someone said there's a hole in every person's heart, and only God can fill that vacancy, that hole in the heart of a person. Do you know that God has put you and me in charge of our own soul, and we can save it, or we can lose it? The scripture says, what is a man profit? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. You know, sometimes people say, well, I don't believe God will send anybody to hell. And God doesn't send people to hell. We choose whom we will serve. And we choose our destiny beyond this life. And so if a person dies lost without Christ and goes into a Christless eternity, they do it by their own choice. To reject Christ as Savior is to rob yourself. But then we as Christians rob ourselves. 1 Corinthians 6 and 19 says, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you're bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You see, our life belongs to God. And so when we take our life and we try to live it independent of God, we are robbing ourselves. If God is not first place in our life, we are robbing ourselves. If we are not seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then we are robbing ourselves. God gives us gifts and talents with which to serve him. And when we fail to use these, we rob ourselves. God gives us multiple promises in the scripture based on conditions. And when we fail to meet those conditions, then we rob ourselves. We 
we as Christians rob ourselves of joy, of peace, of fellowship, of usefulness, of fulfillment. Being a Christian is the most wonderful life any person can live. Serving the Lord is, is wonderful. It is uh, the ultimate in life. And yet, we, how many Christians really are enjoying their salvation? How many have joy unspeakable and full of glory? How many have peace that passes understanding? Sometimes we just mope around as though we're not going to make it another day. Out of our hearts should flow thanksgiving and praise and Adoration to God. And I know everybody has difficulties. Everybody has struggles. But in the midst of our struggles, God is the same. We're just as much saved in the valley as we are on the mountaintop. Amen. We rob ourselves when we don't live as God has commanded us to live. We shorten our life in this world. We rob ourselves of future rewards in heaven. We rob ourselves by preoccupation or procrastination. We rob ourselves and others by, take, by not taking advantage of opportunities that come our way every day to serve the Lord. We need to seize upon the opportunities to share a witness with those who are lost without Christ. When we fail to do that, we rob ourselves of the joy of seeing another person born into the family of God, and we rob others as well. So sometimes we steal from others, sometimes we steal from ourselves, and then sometimes we steal from God. Malachi 3 and 8 asks the question, Will a man rob God? And the people asked God, Wherein have we robbed you? And God said, In tithes and in offerings. There was one man from the IRS who said, Either the church is the richest organization in the world, or church members are the biggest liars in the world. Folks, we as Christians rob God. We rob him of money. Is it reasonable for God to ask us to give a tithe of our income back to the Lord? Well, it's God who gives us life, who gives us health, who gives us a job, who gives us the energy to work a job, this body of ours belongs to God, and he gives us a mind to think with, feet to walk with, hands to work with, eyes to see, ears to hear, air to breathe, food to eat, a job to work and make a, a living. And so, do we owe God anything? Yes, we owe him everything. Most of all, God's given us salvation, hasn't he? He's given us his ever-abiding presence. But when we rob God, we rob ourselves. God said in Malachi 3 and 10, Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. If Christians paid their tithes, the church would not need for anything. When we give to God, it's because God has already blessed us. God never asks us to give on credit. But when we give to God what belongs to him, God promises even more blessings. But really, we don't give to God because uh, I'm going to get something else, but we give to God because he's already blessed us. But Malachi 3 and 10 says, God, God says, 
Not Malachi, but God says, prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open to you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive you. God said, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. In Malachi 3, God promises a blessing upon the finances of the giver. And he also pronounces a curse upon the finances of those who rob God. We rob God of money, but we rob him in many other ways and, and maybe even more so in other ways. Do you know what God wants from you most of all? He wants you. He wants me. You see, we are the objects of God's love. God doesn't need my money. He doesn't need your money. Because he owns the universe and everything that is in it. And really, he owns you and me because Jesus bought us, paid for us on the cross of Calvary when we were sold under sin. And yes, we owe God everything. Let's give to God our body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. He said, which is our reasonable service. Let's give to God our worship, our praise, our thanksgiving. Let's give to God our time, our talents, our gifts, our skills, our energies. When we fail to give to God, we rob God and we rob ourselves. This eighth commandment says, Thou shalt not steal. If I should say, Will all the thieves come to the altar? There wouldn't be room enough because we would all have to come. At times, we're guilty of robbing God. So as God has spoken to our hearts, and we see those areas where we need to change or improve, will we act upon that impression? As God has spoken to our heart. Let's pray. Lord, we look in our lives at how much you have given us. You've given us life, air to breathe. You've given us food to eat, shelter, clothing. You've given us eyes to see the beauty of your creation now as we look about us and see all the, the beautiful scenery that you have made and allowed us to enjoy day by day your blessings. They're just more abundant than we could ever imagine. Lord, thank you for your love and your blessings. And we realize that we owe you everything. Lord, without you, we are nothing. We could do nothing. But today, most of all, Lord, you've given us Jesus and salvation through Jesus' shed blood on that cross. And by giving us salvation, you've given us everything. You've given us eternal, everlasting life. You've given us heaven. You've given us your presence day by day. You've given us grace that is sufficient for every circumstance and every need. And Lord, we can face life because of you. We can face eternity because of you. Whatever our tomorrow holds, 
we can face it because we will be sufficient through you. Thank you, Lord, for your love and blessings. May we give back to you that which is yours. Thank you, Lord, for your love. In Christ's name.